the Pacific Marine Review, in June 1912, reported the following. During the course of the trial, the Beaver admitted that she was partly at fault in not having stopped as the regulations provide, but maintained that the Acelia was also improperly navigated and was also at fault. During the course of the trial, it was brought out that while the Celia was being run at a moderate speed, her engines were not stopped until the instant before the collision. And the court held that this was in violation of Article 16 of the Rules of the Road and held her equally to blame. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Celia and the Beaver are both to blame. Here we are. Enjoy! The events leading to both ships being found equally responsible for all damages sustained by the collision at sea would serve for years as an example to people in charge of ships of what not to do, as well as a case that set a precedent for deciding other similar cases in the courts. The newly built 4,507-ton steamship, the Beaver, was an American vessel under the command of Captain William Kidston. She departed from San Francisco to Portland on the 22nd of November, 1910 with 105 passengers as well as a general cargo of goods for the San Francisco Portland Steamship Company. Almost as soon as the Beaver left port, they encountered a thick fog. Captain Kidston ordered that the speed of his ship be reduced, and he had the ship's automatic fog whistle, which sounded once every 35 seconds, to be engaged. The Celia, meanwhile, was approaching San Francisco after a long voyage. The 4,459-ton steamer had been built in 1907 and was registered in Norway, but it was chartered by the Portland and Asiatic Steamship Company. It was for them that she made her last voyage, under the command of Captain Lee. Departing from Portland on the 22nd of January with a cargo of flour bound for Hong Kong, then stopping in Yokohama before heading back. This had not been a voyage without incident. On the 1st of June, the Celia was reported to have grounded in the Tsugaru Straits, but it had not damaged the ship, and her voyage continued without further concerns. The same paper that reported the grounding of the Celia also had another article published right by its side, announcing that a new ship, the Beaver, had arrived and seemed likely to challenge the record-making trips that had been made by her sister ship, the Bear. Now, having almost completed its nearly year-long voyage, the Celia hit the same fog that the Beaver had around one in the morning of the 22nd, and she also engaged her fog whistle. The two ships were about to be named next to one another in the newspapers again, but this time it would be for the same incident. When the Celia had hit the fog, the third officer of the ship, who had been in command at the time, called for the captain to the deck, and Captain Olaf Lee remained on the deck from then on, even though he said that other than the fog, the weather was good, and the sea was calm. Due to the thick fog, the Celia was now only traveling at half speed, which was about six knots, and... When Captain Lee heard a whistle coming from off his bow in the thick fog around three in the afternoon, Captain Lee would say that he had not thought it necessary to reduce his speed at that time. Captain Lee assumed it was the point ray's whistle due to how faint and distant it was, even though he could hear it clearly. Around five minutes later, at 3.05, Captain Lee realized that it could not be one of the whistles of the Golden Gate Bridge, or of the surrounding area. It was approaching them faster than they were traveling. 
Captain Lee now knew that there was another ship in the area, but he could not determine where the sound was coming from. He ordered his ship to be reduced to slow, a speed of three knots, but they continued to travel forward. Captain Lee had also realized that he was slightly off course and too close to the shore, and so he ordered a slight course change. Captain Kidston would say that the beaver was not traveling at full speed due to the fog. But her exact speed was a matter of some debate later, to the extent that it was put to multiple specialists and expert witnesses who were asked to calculate how fast they thought the beaver had been traveling. Captain Lee would say that he believed that the beaver was going as fast as 50 knots, while Captain Kidston would say that they were traveling at 12 knots. It was eventually decided to be a moot point, since it was agreed by both sides that this was indeed too fast considering the thick fog that the ships found themselves in. Captain Kidston would also say that he had just heard the fog whistle of the Celia right before they saw her. Unlike Captain Lee, who said that he had been hearing the fog whistle of the beaver for some time, Captain Kidston said that they had heard the fog whistle of the Celia, responded once, and then heard the whistle again. Ten seconds later, while still trying to see through the fog and see where the other ship was, the Celia appeared across their bow suddenly in the fog. The beaver gave three short blasts on his whistle a signal to not cross their bows, only for the Celia to respond with the same signal back. Captain Kidston immediately ordered that the engines be reversed, but it was too late. The general agreement was that, due to the speed that the ship was traveling in, she still had a lot of headway, and simply ordering the engines to be reversed right before the collision was too little too late but Captain Kidston argued that a sudden swell of the tide had carried his ship forward and that they were practically at a standstill right before the collision. Captain Lee also said that when he had seen the beaver, he had ordered the engines of the Celia also reversed, also too little too late. No matter the reason, the prow of the beaver plunged into the side of the Celia at 3.15 in the afternoon. Since her engines were already reversed, the beaver backed away from the Celia. The Celia floated for a little while, but the injury to her was clearly fatal to everyone on both ships. The passengers, who had rushed on deck when the three short blasts of the whistle had sounded, knowing something was wrong, could see a gaping hole in the side of the Celia from the deck to below the waterline. While the passengers on the beaver were still trying to take stock of what had occurred, the people on the Celia were already preparing to evacuate the ship. The beaver, meanwhile, also lowered two boats with the intention of helping anyone they could. It was generally agreed that, for the most part, everyone was calm on both ships. A few of the passengers on the beaver were startled enough by the collision that they put on life preservers But the purser and some of the other ship's officers wandered through the crowd, reassuring people, and they convinced passengers to return the life preservers to where they had been found, since they were not needed. The first boat to depart from the Celia had Captain Lee's wife and his two children, a seven-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. With them also came the family servant of several years, a man named Lee Young, who had been the one to rush the children out of the cabin and to the boat when the collision had happened. After assisting Captain Lee's wife into the waiting boat, Lee Young managed to carry both children down and placed them in their mother's arms. Only when the family was secure did Lee Young take his place at the oars and join the others in rowing towards the beaver. Captain Lee did not join them on this boat. As the captain, he stuck by his duty and ensured that he was the last one to leave the ship.
As the boat carrying Mrs. Lee and her children approached the side of the beaver, one of the boats was being lowered by the beaver to assist the people on the salia. Fred Amon, a sailor on the beaver, was employed trying to cast off the davit ropes when a large wave overturned him and the boat he was in. Fred Amon found himself being swept along by the tide. Lines were quickly thrown to him from the ship, as were several life preservers, but none of these reached him. Mrs. Lee proved to be the fast thinker on her boat. She grabbed an oar from one of the sailors and used it to reach out to Amon. He managed to grab a hold of it, and with the help of two of the sailors from the Salia, they were able to haul Amon onto their boat. The relieved passengers on the beaver let out a cheer, and when she reached the deck, Mrs. Lee was quickly showered with praise which she shrugged off as she thought she had done exactly what was expected of a captain's wife. Lee Young at first had anchored the boat they traveled in to the side of the beaver by a rope ladder, but the sea was rolling too much for anyone to use a ladder as intended. Captain Kidston ordered the starboard freight porthole opened to allow people to pass through that instead. Captain Lee's wife and children were passed through first, and then the rest of the sailors scrambled after. Lee Young had allowed everyone to go ahead of him and help them as needed. Unfortunately, this meant that by the time he was the last person on the boat, he was exhausted and seemed unable to save himself. The boat was starting to drift away from the side of the beaver at this point, and though a line was thrown to him, he was not able to climb it. Finally, Lee Young simply tied the rope around his waist and allowed those on board of the beaver to pull him up over the railing and to safety. It was reported that by the time that the beaver returned to port, though, Lee Young was already back to helping Mrs. Lee with the care of the children. The newspaper that carried the story said that much like Mrs. Lee, Lee Young seemed indifferent to the cheers and praise of the passengers of the beaver for his actions. A second boat arrived from the Celia without incident, and then Captain Lee, with five remaining members of the crew and all the ship's papers, got into a boat and prepared to launch it. This boat was not so lucky. The waves smashed the boat to pieces against the side of the ship, and all of the men who had lowered it, including Captain Lee, were thrown into the water. Captain Lee managed to climb back onto the deck of the sinking ship, and after running across the deck, found a davit rope still hanging from the side of the ship from launching another boat. Using this, he was able to reach the water on the other side of the ship where one of the beaver's boats was nearby, and able to pull him out of the water. Three of the sailors who were thrown into the water when the boat smashed managed to find pieces of the broken boat to cling onto until the boats of the beaver were able to save them as well. Two of the sailors were lost, though. Also lost were the ship's papers, which would further complicate later court matters. The Celia had begun to sink almost as soon as the collision occurred, with her forward deck soon awash with water, and she sank bow first, with her stern rising 50 feet into the air, with the propeller still turning. The deck freight was pitched into the ocean, and the spokestack went beneath the waves with one final long loud blast of her steam whistle. The passengers on board of the beaver were shocked to find that they could hear the air slowly hissing through the deck of the Celia as she sank, before she suddenly twisted and went down bottom up, with her keel and screw being the last anyone saw of her. It had only taken about 15 minutes from the collision for the Celia to entirely disappear. The beaver had not come out of the collision unscathed. Her bow was damaged, and some of the crushed plates were allowing water in, but as the officers reassured the passengers, the waterproof bulkheads served their purpose and did not allow the ship to sink. The beaver limped back into San Francisco only hours after they had left it badly damaged and with a lot of people on board who were still in shock. Much of the attention and interviews from the papers would focus on the beaver and what her passengers thought of the whole matter, not the least of which because 
a majority of the crew of the Celia was Chinese, and when the papers did speak to them, it was not kindly. Captain Lee would soon gain much more attention, though. The inquiry into the wreck found fault with both ships. Article 16 in the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, adopted in 1890, had stated very clearly that when a vessel proceeding in a fog heard a fog signal of another vessel that was presumably forward of her, or whose position was not ascertained, the vessel had a duty to stop their engines. Neither Captain Kidston or Captain Lee had done so, even though both of them admitted themselves familiar with the regulations. The decision of the inquiry did not stop Captain Lee, as well as the owners of the Celia, to go against Captain Kidston and the San Francisco Portland Steamship Company for the loss of the Celia. The owners of the ship sought to get payment for their ship and their cargo from the steamship company, while Captain Lee, in an independent suit, wanted to be repaid for the loss of the personal belongings of himself and his crew. It was a lengthy court battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court, but on every level, it was decided in the same way. Since both captains were to blame, no damages would be paid. And both ships were responsible for the damages to their own ships due to their actions. The court case went on so long, and Captain Kidston's testimony was needed so often that he was removed from his command of the beaver which continued her usual run. It did not have a permanent impact on his career, however. Once the matter was decided, he was placed on the South America route of the same company. Though in the collision neither captain had acted as they should to prevent the accident, the Beaver and Captain Kidston had definitely gotten off more lightly. Captain Kidston still had a command, and the Beaver was still above water. For more information, please see the San Francisco Call from November 23, 1910, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.